Well, thank you very much um, for the very kind words um, and for the invitation and to the organizers for uh, inviting me. Um, I thought I should uh, share with you, before I start, the latest invention from Cambridge, which I thought you'd be interested in, which is a car powered not by ever expensive petrol, but by faith. And that all you need to do um, is to say, thank God, to get the car moving and to say amen, to slow it down and stop. Well, of course, the leader of my community, the chief rabbi, thought he'd better try this car. So he took it out and said, thank God, and off it went. And it was going up a hill, and it was going a bit too slowly, so he said, thank God, again. And it went a bit faster over the top of the hill. It was going a bit too fast, and he said, amen, nothing happened. So he said amen a bit more loudly, and still nothing happened. And he saw ahead of him the edge of a precipice. And he screamed, amen. And the car screeched to a halt with two wheels over the edge. And then he leant back and said, oh, thank God. <laughs> so I've been asked to talk to you about what replaces replacement theology. Now this, as a theology, refers to the traditional Christian teaching that with the coming of Jesus Christ, the church has taken the place of the Jewish people as God's elect community. The term is substantially equivalent to another word, supersessionism, and the two are often used interchangeably. Both designate a theological perspective that interprets Christian faith generally and the status of the church in particular so as to claim or imply the abrogation or the obsolescence of God's covenant with the Jewish people. I think this is an incredibly important topic and well chosen by the organizers, not only because of its relevance to Jewish Christian relations and frankly also to Islam, but to Christian self-understanding and I would suggest will help us consider perhaps the topic of our time how do you solve the problem that has led people to kill one another in the name of God since the birth of human civilization? I mean, at the end of the day, Judaism, Christianity, Islam, all claim to be true. They conflict. Therefore, they cannot be true. At most, one is. If Christianity is true, then Judaism is false. If Islam is true, then Christianity and Judaism are false. It follows, surely, that these religions are bound to conflict whenever their devotees take their truth claims seriously. Replacing replacement theology is that important. Let's begin with the term covenant, which in Hebrew, anyone know Hebrew for covenant? Now I'm going to test the great wisdom. Can you go? Right. <laughs> Should I ask him or not? Yeah, I won't. I won't. There's hospitality I and there's hospitality. You to be moderator by answering questions, you know. <laughs> okay. I'm not going to ask the Jewish member of this uh, audience. That's a bit of an... Un okay. Hebrew word for covenant, please. Berit. Excellent. Berit. A term that refers to God initiating the covenant with a community of people and that community accepting certain obligations and responsibilities as partners. You need two parties to have a covenant. A covenant is not as sometimes mistakenly assumed a contract or a transaction, but is an agreement dependent upon a relationship. The former chief rabbi, Lord Sachs, explained this as follows. In a covenant, he wrote, two or more individuals, each respecting the dignity and integrity of the other, come together in a bond of love and trust to share their interests, sometimes even to share their lives by pledging their faithfulness to one another and to do together what neither can do alone. Now, a contract is about interests, but a covenant is about identity. And that is why contracts benefit, but covenants transform. In the New Testament, the concept of the covenant is reinterpreted through the experience of the early Christian community, and the story of Jesus is seen as a new phase in the covenant story of Israel. The change in emphasis is marked by the translation of Berit into the Greek 
Thank you. This is how I make sure my students stay awake when I lecture. You only get the jokes if you listen. So translate it into the Greek diathike, which means decree, in the Septuagint, developed still further in the New Testament, where the concept acquired the meaning of the definitive last will, the last testament, as it were, on the part of God. And the Vulgate translation used the word testamentum, which became the official designation of both parts of the Christian Bible, the Old Testament and the New Testament, with its inescapable implication of replacement. Interestingly enough, in Hebrew, the New Testament is translated by, anybody know, in Israel? Berit Hadasha, which means, literally, New Covenant. Now, from a Jewish perspective, no change took place in Israel's covenantal relationship with God. The traditional rabbinic attitude is that Judaism remained a community of faith. Nothing had been taken away, although there was a change of emphasis. The Sinai covenant became more important, and there was an increased emphasis on the mutuality of the covenantal relationship between God and God's people. This is summarized in a well-known midrash, in which God was depicted as traveling around the world asking various peoples to accept his Torah. Oh, what's the Torah, by the way? Ah. What's the Hebrew root of Torah? Oh, come on. Yara, exactly, which means to, not, not, to instruct, to teach. So the word Torah literally means instruction. When you hear the Hebrew Torah Moshe, the Torah of Moses, it means the instruction, the teaching of Moses. But yet, most people understand it as law. Why? Because when it was translated from Torah into Greek, it was translated into nomos, and then into Latin, into lex, and then into English, into law. And each translation narrowed it down. Sometimes I feel as a Jew that I should walk around burdened by the weight of the law. And it's this stereotype that we have to challenge in Jewish-Christian relations. That is another lecture. In fact, I'll give you a, the examination for my students. I'm sure I can tell you because you won't share it. The examination question traditionally has been, all translation is interpretation. Discuss. And the answer is yes, no, and maybe. <laughs> Now, as far as Christianity was concerned, a radical break had occurred. That wasn't the case in Judaism. And Christianity, as I mentioned, introduced a new covenant, or at, very, at the very least, a radical reinterpretation of the old covenant. According to the, uh, the New Testament, the relationship between God and God's people was mediated decisively through his son, Jesus Christ. And the early church soon regarded the old covenant of Israel as definitely abrogated. Look at how Jeremiah 31 is depicted. The very famous passage, Behold, the days come, says the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Explained, for example, by the epistle to Hebrews as follows. By calling this covenant new, he has made the first one obsolete, and what is obsolete and outdated will soon disappear. So it was not long before fulfillment theology Jesus came to fulfill scripture, slipped into replacement theology. Jesus came to replace Jews, Christianity, replace Judaism. This is illustrated very early in the history of the church. Second century church father called Justin Martyr, who lived around 160 in Samaria, wrote a dialogue with a Jewish interlocutor called Trypho, very famous dialogue. And I quote, when he says to Trypho, he offers various proof texts to show the truth of Christianity and says, and they're from the Psalms, they're from the Torah, they're from various bits of the Old Testament. And then he says, but they're not your scriptures, but ours. For we obey them, but you, when you read, you do not understand. So very soon the church developed a replacement of Judaism. And it's only in the recent period particularly after the Holocaust, when Christians became aware of the inadequacy of replacement theology, which formed the linchpin of what's called the teaching of contempt. L'enseignement du mépris, 
as Jules Isaac called it, of Jews and Judaism. And in fact, um, Morella, in the handout that you've got, you'll see a wonderful picture of Ecclesia in Synagoga. Chosen, not by me. Perfectly chosen, may I say. What do you have? Beautiful image, two statues of two women. Guess which one represents the church? Guess which one represents Judaism? Leah. She was the one who couldn't see properly, unlike her sister, Rachel. Blindfolded because she doesn't see the truth. Her cane broken like Judaism is broken. So that, that is the legacy, that is the, 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 what we're dealing with in probably 1,800 years of Christian history in relations with Jews and Judaism. But now that we realize, both Christian and Jew, that we need to repudiate replacement theology, what actually replaces it? Clearly, the rejection of replacement theology entails some kind of affirmation of the continuing validity of God's covenant with the Jewish people and that Jews continue in some kind of covenantal relationship with God. But what does this mean for the church in light of the Christ event? Whilst Christianity can accept the fact that replacing Judaism can no longer be sustained as a theology, I would suggest, constructing a new theology of the church and the Jewish people remains an unresolved and formidable undertaking. A German scholar, Friedrich Wilhelm Marquardt, viewed covenant as the most constructive biblical concept to describe both Christian identity and contemporary Jewish-Christian relations. His conviction is that churches as representatives of the people of the earth can only hope to become partners in a covenantal relationship with the people of Israel if they are willing to accept the burden of Israel in sanctifying the name of God, which in Hebrew is a term called Kiddush Hashem, sanctifying God's name, if they join in the calling of Israel to restore the world. In Hebrew, the term is tikkun olam, healing of the world. If they are ready to embark with the people of Israel on its journey to the new covenant with God, which lies ahead. So it seems to me there are three possible ways in which Christians may understand the relationship between the old and the new peoples, between Christians and Jews. Firstly, only one, the newer, is truly the people of God. Secondly, there are two peoples of God, the Christians and the Jews. Thirdly, the two peoples are really one people of God, identical in some respects and different on others. Let's just explore each of these. The first position states simply there's only one people of God, that is Christians. In this case, either Jews convert to Christianity or remain as Jews, a remnant destined to suffer, whose lowly position simply gives witness to the truth of Christ. And this is a kind of Augustinian position which is often called the witness doctrine, which dominated Christian thought until about the Enlightenment and soon after. The second position argues that there are two peoples of God, the Jewish and the Christian, and this was espoused by theologians such as Franz Rosenzweig, who suggests that both Jews and Christians participate in God's revelation, and both are, in different ways, intended by God, and only for God is the truth one, but on earth, truth remains divided. And I might touch on that a bit later when we look at the mission, uh, talk at the mission panel. On the Christian side, a very important Anglican minister called James Parks also took the two covenant positions, suggesting that Sinai and Calvary were two parallel experiences providing humanity with complementary revelations. For him... The Sinai revelation emphasized the aspect of community, while the Calvary revelation emphasized the aspect of the individual. Parks remained convinced that the revelation in Christ did not replace the covenant at Sinai, but that Judaism and Christianity were kind of inextricably linked together. And there are, various, uh, vari there are, there are numerous variations in the views of theologians who follow the two peoples of God, sometimes called the two covenant theory, but they tend to share the view, the Christians tend to share the view, that revelation in Christ was a unique event and resulted in a new kind of intimacy between Christians and the divine. It reminds me of a story of my um, Jewish niece called Sarah. Went to primary school. Mother was very, very worried. 
but she wasn't making very many friends. And she came back home one day and said, Mom, I've made a new friend. And her mother was very pleased. Orthodox Jewish mother, who wouldn't be pleased that her daughter's made a new friend? Who's your new friend? Jesus, he's my new friend. Did not go down so well, friends. But I, I, as, as a Jew, I often think that this intimacy that Christians have with the divine through Christ is, is, is very intimate. It's very intimate. Uh, and that's something that I think is particular to the Christian proclamation, the uniqueness, a speciality of Christianity. Among contemporary Jewish supporters of the sort of two covenant theory is an Israeli scholar called David Hartman and myself. My own view is that a covenant between people and God is predicated on a belief in human dignity. What does that mean? It means that all religions, especially Christianity and Islam, have their own covenants with God and are called to celebrate their own dignity and their own particularity. More of that in a while. But the third position, if you remember, was that there really is only one people of God, which combines, consists of Jews and Christians, identical in some ways, different in others. Christians who favor the one people or one covenant approach refer to Ephesians 2.12, which states that to be separate from Christ is to be strangers to the community of Israel. The German Rhineland Synod of 1980, called towards a renewal of the relationship between Christians and Jews, states, and I quote, we believe in the permanent election of the Jewish people as the people of God and realize that through Jesus Christ, the church, of the church is taken into the covenant of God with his people. The most important work, if you want to follow this up, from the Protestant perspective, uh, is a three-volume work by Paul Van Buren called A Theology of Jewish-Christian Reality, who argues that Israel should be recognized as two connected but distinct branches. The Christian church represents the Gentile believers drawn together by the God of the Jewish people in order to make God's love known throughout the world. And through Christ, Gentiles were summoned uh, for the first time as full participants in God's ongoing salvation of humanity. Van Buren argues that both grant branches must grow together rather than in isolation, and that in time they will draw closer whilst retaining their distinctiveness, and that's one of the challenges, I think, of our time. Now, so you have this one covenant theory, this two covenant theory. And in very recent years, a number of scholars have become frustrated and looked for alternative models, alternative approaches. Um, the language of twins has been used by Chaim Perel Mutter. Uh, Mary Boys from New York, uh, Sister Mary Boys, talks about fraternal twins. Daniel Boyerin, important Jewish scholar, talks about co-emergence of Christianity, moving away from the traditional linear dimensions of the relationship uh, to a sense of both Judaism and Christianity emerging out of Second Temple Judaism at the same time. But the reference to branches should, of course, remind you of St. Paul. I always had a, a soft spot for St. Paul as a Jew. I know many of my Christian friends find Paul difficult Sounds like most of you do. But you know, if someone took seven of your letters or your emails and tried to create a systematic theology, would that be possible? <laughs> but Paul is the teacher par excellence. It reminds me of the story of, uh, in, in, in pre-modern times, rabbis used to go from village to village teaching. And this is the story of a rabbi who went, every time he got to a village, the townsfolk would come out, they would hug him, they would kiss him, they would give him presents, they would ignore his driver completely. They'd bring the rabbi into synagogue, he'd stand somewhere here, they'd open the Talmud, they'd ask him questions, he'd answer them, he'd hug, he'd kiss, he'd get more presents, and he left. And the driver got a bit fed up with this. He said, Rabbi, they ignore me. I tell you what, in the next village, let me put on your clothes, let me pretend to be the rabbi, you be the driver, be good for your humility. And the rabbi said, you don't know anything. You won't be able to answer these questions. And the driver said, trust me. So they got changed. They swapped their clothes. The rabbi became the driver. The driver became the rabbi. They got to the village. The village folk came out. 
They hugged the driver, who was actually the thought that was the rabbi. They kissed him. They gave him presents. They took him into the synagogue. They put him up and the bima here. They opened the Talmud and they asked him a really difficult question. Meanwhile, the rabbi, who pretends to be the driver, was standing at the back of the synagogue. He said, now you're going to get your just desserts now. And the driver looked at the Talmud. He looked at the people. He said, ha! He said, you think this is a hard question? Even my driver knows the answer. Come up and give the answer. (laughs) So when you read Paul, particularly when he explores the relationship between the identity of the people of Israel and the relationship with the Almighty, it's not easy. And it's unfortunate in the extreme that his views are commonly simplified, misleadingly so, it seems to me. For Paul, Paul is the New Testament writer par excellence who grapples with the meaning of covenant and the election of the church. He's generally viewed as arguing that membership of the true Israel, in Latin, the verus Israel, not as one of my students wrote recently, versus Israel, but verus Israel, who struggles uh, with the meaning of covenant and the election of the church, they say. He's viewed as arguing that membership of the true Israel is not determined on physical descent from Abraham, but on the spiritual affinity to Abraham's trusting relationship with God. In other words, Israel is composed of both Jews and Gentiles. The former, due to their spiritual past, include those who have extended their trust in God to a dependence upon Jesus as Lord. The latter include those Gentiles who have entered into the covenantal relationship with God by their acceptance of Jesus. Now, this is a facile interpretation because it simply imputes to Paul the view that the old becomes new. And that's the view I'd like to challenge. On the back of some incredibly important Christian scholarship, beginning with a Lutheran scholar called Christa Stendhal, the former Bishop of Stockholm, who wrote a book called Paul Amongst Jews and Gentiles. And Stendhal showed that Paul could not accept the idea that Jews as a people and religion are totally outside and forever outside the people of God. According to Stendhal, Paul suggests that both Israel and the church are elect and both participate in the covenant of God. Paul affirms that the Jewish people, despite their disobedience towards Christ, are still the elect people of God and that Christian Gentiles are honorary citizens grafted into the rich olive tree of Jewish heritage. So while Paul argued that unbelieving Jews are in a state of disobedience from his perspective regarding Christ, nevertheless, they remain unreservedly, unreservedly, irrevocably in a continued election. And in his letters to the Romans, particularly chapters 9 to 11, he asks a very important question. What about the ongoing relationship, ongoing validity between God's covenant with his Jewish people? Did the church as the new Israel, simply replace the old as inheritors of God's promises? And if so, does this mean that God reneges on his word? And just in case you are going to give the wrong answer, he gives it for you by no means. Because obviously, if God has abandoned Jews, what guarantee is there, my friends, that he won't abandon you? Now, you might argue and it's very reasonable, and I say this as a Jew, that many Jews have not kept their faith with God, and therefore God has a perfect right to cast us off. What did the Israelites do at the moment of revelation? The golden calf. The moment of revelation at Mount Sinai. It's the next Steven Spielberg blockbuster. It's all happening above, and it's exciting below. Okay, so God has every right to cast off the Jewish people. Yes. But it's interesting that those Christians who might argue this way have not often drawn the same deduction about Christian faithfulness, which has not been a notable and consistent characteristic of the last 2,000 years, I might suggest. Actually, God seems to have had a remarkable ability to keep faith with both Christians and Jews when we do not deserve it, a point of which Paul is 
strongly aware in Romans 9 to 11. He goes out of his way to deny claims that God has rejected the chosen people and asserts that their stumbling does not lead to their fall. And on top of this, he offers a severe warning that Gentile Christians should not be haughty or boastful towards unbelieving Jews, much less cultivate evil intent and engage in persecution against them. And unfortunately, this critical warning was almost totally forgotten by Christians who tended to remember Jews as enemies, but not as beloved of God, have taken to heart Paul's criticisms and used them against Jews while forgetting Paul's love for Judaism and Jews. And you can see a little bit of that in the quote I've given you from Claude Montefiore with the selection of biblical passages. That selective reading is what replacement theology is all about. In Paul's view, it was impossible for God to elect the Jewish people as a whole and then later displace them. For if that was the case, of course, the same could happen with Christians. In his view, why was there a hardening? Why was there a stumbling by Jews so that Gentiles would receive the opportunity to join the people of God? The church's election, therefore, derives from that of Israel. It does not imply that God's covenant with Israel is broken. Rather, it remains unbroken irrevocably and that is the basis for the intrinsic Christian relationship with Jews and Judaism theologically. That is what overcomes and replaces replacement theology. At the heart of Christian scripture. So scripture provides the common ground for the Jewish Christian encounter, even though it clearly results also in division. You know, the, the glib statement, Jews and Christians are divided by a common Bible, another set question, is not as glib as you might think. In your handout, you have a quote from the Reformation Churches, 2001 document called Church in Israel. I won't read it all, you've got it there and you might want to refer to it in your questions. But that last sentence I'd like to emphasize, the relationship with Israel, and by Israel of course we mean the Jewish people. Israel means what, by the way? Literally, what does Israel mean? Yeah, someone, a person wrestling with God. The whole concept of wrestling with the divine, that's what Israel means. The relationship with Israel is therefore for Christians and for the churches an indispensable part of their foundation of faith. So as a result of these sorts of exhortations, biblical study, I think we referred, Francis, to the scriptural reasoning, where Jews, Christians, and Muslims are studying texts together, um, and in this case in Jewish-Christian relations, you can't understand your own faith without understanding Judaism. And that, of course, is true not only of Christians, who need to be reminded that Jesus was a Jew, that the first Christians were Jews, and occasionally, I have to remind my Catholic students that his mother was not Catholic. When I put an article in, I think it was Irish Theological Journal, a few years ago, called Mary the Jewish Mother, I can't tell you the number of odd letters I got. Really, was she Jewish? She was a first century Palestinian Jewish woman. But what's interesting as well is not only this Christian awakening to the Jewishness of Jesus, but the Jewish awakening to the Jewishness of Jesus in a more constructive and conciliatory way. You think of scholars such as Geza Vermesh, Samuel Sandmel, David Flusser in Israel, A.J. Levine in the States, who demonstrate considerable Jewish interest in this area. And the study of New Testament from a Jewish perspective, qua Judaism, is a growth area. Not only that, in your handout, you not only have a quote from the churches of the Reformation, but also from Dabru Amet, the first modern Jewish statement about the place of Christianity in Jewish terms. Pretty short, about the same length of Nostri as Nostriatate, eight paragraphs long, um, and that's the paragraph I've selected for you. Quote, Jews and Christians seek authority from the same book. Now, that's not to say that Jews and Christians agree about the interpretations of the same book. In fact, the order of the book is slightly different. The Christian Old Testament ends with Malachi. The Jewish Bible, the Tanakh, ends with Excellent. The second book of Chronicles. The second book of Chronicles. Malachi, of course, looks forward to the coming of the Messiah. And the second book of Chronicles is all about the temple. 
So you have these little differences, but fundamentally you have the same book, but the interpretation and our differences in interpretation will not be redeemed, it seems, to the authors of Dabra Met and the hundreds of Jewish figures who signed it, until a time of God's choosing. Now, okay, what might a replacement theology look like in the context of that big question that I wanted to ask at the beginning, the problem that has led people to kill one another in the name of God? Shouldn't we... Well, I tell you what, our critics certainly do use this, because there are plenty of examples of it, my own community, of radicalization and extremism in parts of the church, in parts of the Muslim world. Surely, we should live with the uncertainty of doubt than the certainty of faith. For it's that very certainty that leads people convinced of their righteousness to commit unspeakable crimes. That is the challenge that we face. That is the indictment we have to answer. Now, whilst I may be true, convinced of the truth of Judaism, Christians and Muslims believe with equal fervor that their faith, not mine, is true. So how can we live peaceably together whilst at the same time honoring the commitments of our respective faiths? And this is where I think, from a Jewish position at least, and I hope you'd agree also from a Christian, that the covenantal relationship provides the key. It certainly provides the key for unlocking replacement theology. When the Bible describes God as in the Jewish reading, the, 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 the Torah and the synagogue just a few weeks ago, in, towards the end of the book of Exodus, God says, Ani kuret berit, I make a covenant. Literally, I cut a covenant, God says to Moses. Uh, I make a covenant. And by saying that, the relationship becomes moral. You see... Often the Bible records God as seeing. For example, seeing what he had made, and behold, it was good, or very good. Seeing the episode of the, God, uh, of the golden calf where God says to Moses, I've seen this people, and they are a stiff-necked people. The covenant is not seen. The covenant is heard. It's affirmed. It's spoken. It's heeded. It's assented to. It belongs to the culture of the ear, not the eye. Why is that important? Because words can be used not just, to dis, not just to describe the world, but to create relationships, make promises, undertake obligations. When I say seriously and sincerely, I promise to do better, I'm not merely describing something, but doing something, I'm making a promise. When a Jewish groom under the wedding canopy called the chuppah gives his bride a ring, he says, behold, you are betrothed unto me by this ring according to the Torah of Moses and Israel. He's not speaking about a marriage. He is creating a marriage. So covenants are similarly a kind of institutional fact created by what the philosopher John Searle calls performances utterances, performative utterances. Facts that do not reside in physical properties of objects, but in rules and conversations by which they are governed. In the case of the covenant, these utterances are divine command and human consent, a two-way relationship. So the covenant informs us on what we are called to do, what we are to refrain from doing. So the language of covenant shifts from description to prescription, from what is to what ought to be, from what human beings are to an ethical statement of what we may or may not do. And this is the meaning of I make a covenant with you. It is a move from things seen to things heard, from the visual to the practical construction of what we might call, I don't know, the proto-big society. The Jewish world is defined by things heard. Our key practices are study, our prayer, the word addressed by human beings to God and the word addressed by God to humanity. It's no coincidence that Jesus is called Logos, the word. Now this stands in direct contrast to a language saturated with visual metaphors for knowledge. We speak of insight, hindsight, foresight, of a view, a perspective, a vision. We call people perceptive. When we understand something, we say, I see. In Judaism, the key metaphors are all auditory. In the Talmud, phrases referring to knowledge, understanding, or tradition are often variants of the verb shama, hear, 
listen. The key biblical command is Deuteronomy 6, verse 4, Shema Israel, hear, O Israel, hearken, O Israel. And this isn't accidental. The God of the Hebrew Bible is invisible. All visual representations are forbidden, some idolatrous. Even the texture of the biblical narrative is non-visual. We have no idea what Abraham or Moses looked like, certainly not Charlton Heston. There is little or no description of the biblical landscapes. Biblical prose does not capture the play of light on surfaces. Instead, it focuses our attention on the sound, on the resonance, inflections, and innuendos of the heard word. It's not a coincidence that Muslim scripture is called the Quran, the recitation. In the Bible, when God showed himself to Moses and to the Israelites, Israelites, it wasn't in the image, but in the call. When Elijah perceived God, he heard only a still, small voice. So when I gaze at a painting or a sculpture or watch a drama, I'm in a kind of different dimension. I'm observing what's going on in front of me. I am a kind of subjective self. I'm not part of the landscape or the play. I'm like Zeus looking down on the human drama from the top of Mount Olympus. Interested, but detached. In contrast, in the covenant, I am involved. I'm part of the action. I'm seeing events as they unfold. First from this perspective, then that perspective. I hear a multiplicity of voices. I struggle to discern the meaning of the plot, the sense, the purpose, trying to separate the music from the noise. In other words, Bible is not history, what happened to somebody else at a certain time, but memory. The story of Judaism, and of Christianity, what happened to our ancestors, and therefore, insofar as we carry on their story, and I think we do, what happens to us. The Bible speaks not of moral truths in the abstract, but of commands, which is to say truths addressed to us, calling for a response. Now, some of my more scientific colleagues and friends in Cambridge tease me, saying, they seek the answers to the big questions. What is knowledge? What is truth? What is really there? They tell me that a statement and its opposite cannot both be true. Either there is or there is not a lectern in this room. Either Napoleon was or was not defeated by Wellington 200 years ago. Either the universe did or did not have a beginning in time. That works fine for facts and for descriptions, but it does not work at all well for Humanity's search for meaning. Meaning is not to be found in scientific facts, pure reason, or physical description. Even Richard Dawkins notes at the end of this book, The Selfish Gene, that scientific facts entail nothing about how we should or should not act. And I quote, we alone on earth can rebel against the tyranny of the selfish replicators, he wrote. So meaning is not found in systems, but in stories. Not in nature, but in narrative. The stories we tell about ourselves, about who we are, where we came from, what is our place in the universe, and therefore what we are called on to do. And that's why the Bible, the supreme example of our search for meaning, is written in the form of a narrative. It's not philosophy. Narrative celebrates the concrete. It's not the abstract, the particular, not the universal. The open future made by human choice, not the closed, predictable future of scientific law and historical inevitability. Narrative does not exist in the opposition between the objective and the subjective, but in the intersubjective, in that middle. In other words, it belongs to the same domain as performative utterances, institutional facts, and covenants. Because narrative, narrative truth is not like scientific or logical truth. It does not obey the law of the excluded middle, for example. It doesn't operate on the either-or, true-false model. It contains multiple points of view that are open, essentially, not accidentally, to more than one interpretation, more than one level of interpretation. And nor does the validity of one story exclude another. Stories, narratives, do more than reflect facts about the world. They offer interpretations of the world. They attempt to make sense out of the raw data of events. They create worlds. They do not merely describe them. Now, what is true of texts is true of relationships. Relationships are multifaceted in a way physical facts are not. I either am or I'm not mainly black-haired, short-sighted and bespectacled. But I am simultaneously 
a child of my parents, the father of my children, the husband of my wife. I have colleagues, friends, neighbours, co-religionists. I'm a citizen of England, of the United Kingdom, of Europe, as well as belonging to humanity as a whole. Each of these relationships is covenantal in the sense that it involves reciprocal obligation. And sometimes these obligations conflict. Should I accept a speaking invitation in Glasgow or spend time with my wife and children over the Passover period? I'm torn between my responsibilities as an interfaith dialogue leader of some kind and my duties as a father and husband. But there's no principled incompatibility between these loyalties. The truth of one does not entail the falsity of the other. Do you see where I'm going? There is a profound difference between thinking, if my faith is true and conflicts with yours, then yours is false and needs to be replaced. Faith as a covenant means that if I and my fellow believers believe I have a relationship with the Almighty, that does not entail that you do not. I have my stories, rituals, memories, prayers, and celebrations, and you have yours. That's what makes me me and you you. The truth of one does not entail the falsity of the other. Indeed, the very words true and false seem out of place here, as if we're using words from one domain to describe phenomena belonging to another. Covenantal language does not speak of brute facts, but institutional ones, not of physical descriptions, but of systems of meaning, modes of belonging, ways in which groups relate to themselves, the universe, its author. So faith in the Bible is a moral quantity, a condition that generates trust, the essential precondition to interpersonal relations. The scientific question is, what can I know about the world? The biblical question is, how should I act? How should I expect others to act if we are to achieve together what none of us can do alone? The former generates narratives of displacement. Truth cannot coexist with falsehood. If I'm convinced that I possess the truth, while you are sunk in error, I may try to persuade you. But if you refuse to be persuaded, I may conquer you or convert you, imposing my view on you by force in the name of truth. And this thinking leads to and has led to the mindset of I'm wrong, I'm right, you're wrong, go to hell. A covenant, however, with its acknowledgement of the multiplicity of narratives, relationships, interpretations, is fundamentally opposed to displacement narratives. It subverts them. The message is that despite our differences, we each have integrity and dignity in the mind of God, and one of God's messages to us is that we must learn to live together by making space for one another. And we are reminded, and this is a point of immense significance, that beyond the truths that define the human situation as such, all further relationships between the Almighty and humanity are covenantal. None excludes the other. God may be with us, but may also be with those who are not like us, with friends, but also with strangers. A covenant provides meaning and gives purpose, and the concepts of human freedom, responsibility, and human dignity follow. Whilst in Greece, and to a certain extent Cambridge, may have produced philosophers, Israel produced prophets. Greece gave us tragedy. Israel, its opposite, hope. Now, if all this is difficult, which in many ways it is, let me say it another way. My wife and I have three children. We love them equally and unconditionally. They are very different from one another. Different strengths, skills, interests, temperaments, and emotional needs. And if we, as parents, favored one, at the cost of the others, we would have failed. Still more would we have failed if, having loved our firstborn, we then withdrew that affection on the birth of our subsequent children, transferring it each time to the youngest. Such behavior would have damaged them, creating rivalries, insecurities, and a sense of rejection. And if that is true of human parents, how much more so is it true of the Almighty? Can I really believe that God, having set his love on and made a covenant with the children of Israel, then rejected them when they continue to honor that covenant, choosing not to follow the new faith, Christianity? Can I believe that the God of love, in loving Christians, thereby abandoned Jews? 
Can I make sense of the idea that six centuries after the birth of Christianity and 26 after the journey of Abraham, God revealed that Jews and Christians had been mistaken all along and that their religious destiny was other than they believed it to be? I can believe that Ptolemy, Copernicus, Newton, perhaps even Einstein may be wrong in their scientific beliefs and that if religion is like a science, it's open to such refutations, but that is not the way to view religion or faith because God is not a concept. The Bible reminds us that God is a parent. So let me draw this to a close and apply this to the Jewish Christian encounter. Let me challenge you as Christians to reflect on the Jewish no to Jesus as something constructive, not something negative. Yes, Christians affect, accept the fact now that Jesus was born and lived and died a Jew, but few, as I mentioned, reflect on the fact that his mother was, Jew was Jewish, or that the harsh criticism between the Pharisees and Jesus in the Gospels has much, as much to do with the rivalry of the early church and Judaism than between Jesus and his fellow Jews. The moderator gave a lovely parable this morning about the tax collector and the Pharisee. When I was listening to it, I thought, huh, two Jews. When the New Testament is read as a Christian book with the good guys being Christian and the bad guys being Jews, that way leads to replacement theology. When Jesus tells a story, he does it in a very Jewish way. I wrote a little book on Jesus recently. Actually, it's only a short book, but it was the most difficult book I've ever written because I had to think about, as a Jew, why did I think Jesus changed the world or how did Jesus change the world? Um, and what he does in a very Jewish way is tell a story. His disciples don't understand it. He has to explain it. Oh, my, it's so Jewish. That's why he's called Rabbi. And the only original bit of that book, because what can one say that's original? Well, that might not even be original, but it's to emphasize the humor of Jesus, which is often missed by Christians. The log and the splinter in the eye. The gnat and the camel. It's full of humor. But when it comes to the argument in the New Testament, they are an argument between Jews. If I ask you, who do you argue with most? I'm going to argue. If I ask you, who do you argue with most? What would you say? So. Okay, and after that. Who do I argue with most? I don't argue. Oh, okay. Who do I argue with most? Who do you argue with most? Those you're closest to. In my case, my wife followed by my children. This morning, maybe the other way around. <laughs> but you argue with those you love. And the arguments in the New Testament, yes, they are bitter, they're severe, they're serious, but there's an internal Jewish argument about a Jew from the land of Israel, from the Galilee. And even when Gentiles get involved, they're arguing about Jewish things. Oh, so Jewish. And that's what's been forgotten. They're not Christian arguments against Jews. They're internal Jewish arguments about the significance of a Jew. To read them the wrong way is to misread them in the context of taking Jesus out of his first century Palestinian Jewish ministry. No. That's not easy. Because that challenges some of the fundamental, it's a kind of revision of Christian theology in many ways. Because it means the Jewish no to Jesus postpones the question of who will be revealed as the Messiah at the end of time. This new Catholic document came out in 2015 that talked about this, the question of messianism. Let me explain it to you in terms of a joke. We're coming to the end of the talk. It's been a long talk. It's getting warm in here. So let me explain in terms of a joke. David Flusser, who I mentioned earlier, was an Israeli scholar of what he called first century Judaism, which we would call Christianity. And a group of Christians came to visit him in Jerusalem, and they said, Professor Flusser, we should pray together for the coming of the Messiah. You believe in the coming of the Messiah? I, we believe in the coming of the Messiah. We as Jews and Christians should pray together. And he said, you're right. 
You're right. Let's pray together for the coming of the Messiah, but let me be the first one to ask the Messiah a question when he arrives. Hmm, okay. Okay, Professor Fusser, what would you ask? He said, it's simple. I'd say, excuse me, sir, have you been to Jerusalem before? <laughs> Is it beyond the realms of possibility? Is it beyond the realms of possibility that the Messiah, when he comes, will have many of the traits, characteristics of the Messiah you call Christ? Is the Jewish expectation of the coming of the Messiah so very different from the Christian expectation of the return of Christ? I do not think so, nor do some Christian theologians today. The Jewish no to Jesus reminds Christians that the Messiah has not yet returned. We are not yet living in the messianic age. So what about from the Jewish perspective? Well, I would propose something called Jewish covenantal pluralism, or covenantal, a kind of Jewish covenantal theology. We heard beautifully presented to us those different models of inclusivism, exclusivism, and uh, pluralism. But let's just focus on covenant. From a Jewish point of view, the covenant begins with Noah. And I quote, the children of Noah, that is people other than the children of Israel, were given seven commandments to establish courts of justice, prohibitions of idolatry, blasphemy, sexual immorality, bloodshed, theft, and eating limbs from a live animal. But those very straightforward laws formulate moral standards without any requirement for a conversion to Judaism. Or as Rabbi Yohanan of Tiberius said in the third century, anybody who denies idolatry is called a Jew. So it's the rejection of idolatry, idolatry rather than a doctrinal definition of God that is key. Or what about the term righteous Gentiles? Rabbi Joshua ben Hananiah propounded the view, later became uh, accepted, famously quoted by Maimonides, the righteous of all nations shall have a share in the world to come. A Jewish covenantal theology affirms God's covenant not only with the Jewish people but with Christians and other faith communities who are faithful in their particular covenantal relationship with the Almighty. So I would suggest that for Christians a covenantal focus will aid the construction of a new and positive theology of the church and the Jewish people which is a formidable undertaking because it is a fundamental revision of Christian theology. The issue at stake is simply this, can Christianity differentiate itself from Judaism without asserting itself as opposed to or replaced, or the replacement of Judaism? Can we create the theological space in which to affirm one another, establish a relationship not based on a lack of hostility, but on common values, not on the lack of suspicion, but on creating trust, critical solidarity, mutual affirmation. From a Jewish perspective, I would affirm an irrevocable covenant for Christianity because it creates the theological space for Christians to retain their own special relationship with the Almighty and to see their reflection in a Jewish mirror, serving to deepen Christian faith in Christ and foster Christian respect for their elder siblings.